with Lindsay um, in the oral history department of the Martha's Vineyard Museum. And um, it kind of, June actually connected the two of us because uh, Diana and I had a stint where we were realizing we were losing people that were the history and heart of our towns and people that we relied on the storytelling um, and how much of those stories you forget and you wish you could ask them, but you can't anymore. Yeah. So we just found it so important to talk about oral history and encourage people to share their stories, especially, especially with their family members who hasn't said, oh, I only wish I was mature enough to have had that conversation with my grandmother um, before she passed. So it started this beautiful relationship, I think, between us and the Martha's Vineyard Museum. And we've also been um, learning some technology stuff along the way. Um, Laura is here from the museum as well. Um, I would like to also introduce our other staff. Again, I'm Tanya, I'm the assistant director. Um, we have here uh, Diana Braylard. She is our, our administrative clerk, and she's the one who reaches out to everybody and gets it done. And of course, we've got our fearless leader, Joyce Albertini, um, <laughs> <laughs> encouraging us along the way and teaching us her 30 plus years of knowledge. So. Um, Thank you all for being here. Um, just a couple disclaimers. We will be recording today. And the reason is because this is an oral history um, presentation. Um, and the idea is that we don't want June's answers to get lost, like we were talking about, you know, with um, as time goes. Um, we will have a question and answer at the end of the um, presentation. Um, hopefully June comes. Um, you will probably be muted throughout the conversation just so that there's no outside reverb, the dog barking, all that fun stuff since we're all in our homes, not all of us, but um, most of us. And just remember to uh, adjust your device volume accordingly. Um, but anyways, I'd love to pass it over to Lindsay and she can tell you some more about what her projects are. Um, well, I, as you probably all know, have been collecting oral histories on the vineyard for over 30 years. Um, and uh, the main, my main, one of my main goals in collecting oral histories has been to um, explore and, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, explore and celebrate the amazing diversity of the population of the vineyard um, and give a voice to those who are not always heard. Um, and now as the, as, um, Tanya said, when we started this project is partly the first time we got together was to encourage people to collect oral histories and work with us. And it was also right at the start of the COVID pandemic. So that's kind of stymied plans a little bit, but, you know, now as the island is growing and changing the diverse communities to becoming more and more um, numerous and more complex. Um, we, we really, and hopefully, you know, by this summer um, or by the end of the summer, we will be able to do more workshops with people to train people to collect oral histories from their communities. Because um, I think especially, you know, I go in, I mean, Supposedly, I'm a good interviewer, but I think somebody within the Brazilian community might be able to gain the trust and um, also understand the language better than I would. Um, and so I think that, you know, that we really are going to try to broaden our, um, our group of interviewers to, to bring in more of these um, incredible stories, because I think we have so much to learn from these you know, they're often kind of mundane little day-to-day -day stories, but we learn so much about how a community works and how complex all the different parts of a community are. So um, you'll be hearing more from, you know, the museum about outreach to have people um, start collecting oral histories. But I also want to say that if anybody wants to do it on an individual basis, I would be glad to meet with somebody 
and give them tips and give them um, pointers. You know, because I think it's so easy, just as Tanya was saying, you just think, oh, I'll record that person. That, you know, I'll talk to my mother about that. And, you know, and the time goes by. So I think it's, it's very, um, very important. Um, you know, and these interviews, there's so much to learn um, from understanding our past, understanding people's different perspectives, which people certainly do have on the island. And we need to be reminded what is spe special about the vineyard and what we try to need to work to preserve, what we need to change. Um, you know, it's, it's a race with time um, and things will be lost. So I encourage any of you, if you want to start interviewing within your close pod right now, um, <laughs> and do it um, and, and call me. Um, I'm best reached actually these days I usually am working out of my home. My number is in the phone book, if anyone remembers what a phone book is, um, under Lindsay Lee. Um, so, you know, if anyone wants some pointers or wants some advice, I'd be glad to do that. And we will be doing more presentations about that um, further down the line when we can. Um, what was I gonna say? Um, so in, in our collection here, we have, um, at the museum, there's, we have over 1,700 interviews with people at the vineyard. And um, we're collecting more each week. Um, and, oh, here's my, here's my little pitch for other ways people can help. Um, you know, they're filled with so many little hidden treasures. So, you know, we tried, we've been working for years to make these wonderful oral histories accessible through my Vineyard Voices books, through talks like this, through our social media program that we have on our computer now. Does all of you know about our, the oral history channel and our um, visit the museum from home social media page? So that's one way to share the stories and through our exhibits and, um, and radio talks, et cetera. Um, And I'm going to say, well, you know, th this program today is, you know, I think especially kind of a, a tribute to, to June, you know, because we, I don't know, we all love and cherish June. And um, my little notes, I was going to say about that. Um, uh, um, and you know how you all know how instrumental she is and to the vineyard functioning as a healthy community. I mean, not only is she the, the keeper and font of knowledge about the um, knowledge about the traditions and the history and the lore of the Wampanoag tribe of, um, of Aquina, but she also is so generous about sharing this and sharing her stories. Um, and also, you know, the last count, the last time I asked her about this, um, this is in her retirement. She was on 10 different commi um, committees, you know, the one at the museum, the ones, you know, all sorts of that, and boards that, you know, taking the time to, help the community shape in a healthy way. So, and she's just wonderful and fun and I wish she would show up right now, but what are we gonna do about um, her? <laughs> should I play, should I play the film? Should we play the film so you can see it? So this film is um, just a, an excerpt from an interview that we did with, that I, I guess I did with um, June. And then over the past weeks or so, I added photographs to it to make it, you know, kind of more fun to, to watch. Uh, and there's a lot of, I have a lot of pictures, June helped me find some, and I actually figured it out on my own, from the 1951 Globe. Um, this, actually, two days ago was the 70th anniversary of electricity 
coming to Gay Head. It was the last state in the Commonwealth um, to receive electricity. And, you know, 70 years ago is not that long ago. I mean, there's so many, there are people around now who still remember, as June does, uh, what it was like to live without electricity. So it's pretty amazing um, that, you know, that kind of isolation and hardiness it gave to, um, to a community who was out there sans electricity, without electricity. Um, so um, the pictures from the newspapers are wonderful. I'm gonna keep them here. I couldn't fit them all into the film. And uh, it's interesting that era of all of the women who are married are called um, Mrs. George Cook or Mrs. Peter so-and-so. It's not, nobody has their first name. Um, none of the women do, the men do, um, of course, and the unmarried women do. But so there's little, um, well, I'll just go with the film and you can see it. Take it away, Laura. It's short. It's only four minutes, I think. It was in February 1951, we finally got electricity in Gay Head, and it was a big to-do in town. Some of the ladies in town put on this skit, and they had, like, part of the poles and, and a great big aluminum pan and sand in it, like they were climbing the poles and stringing the wires, and it, it was funny. I, I can vividly remember. It was a really nice production. It was wonderful to get electricity. My sister Judith and I were four and three at the time. And one of the newspapers, either the Boston Globe or the Providence Journal, took a photograph of us looking at a light bulb and like, oh, a new toy, you know? So it was monumental. It was a very big deal. One of the reasons we didn't have electricity was because of the fact that they didn't think that the town could really afford it. Our mother was very involved with the Aquina Women's Club. So the, the Aquina Women's Club had penny sales, they had potluck dinners, they, they did a lot of fundraising to be able to assist in obtaining electricity for Gay Head after we had electricity. What our grandfather did every morning was listen to the fish auction in New Bedford. You know, how much they got paid for uh, each species of fish. It was, a, it was a routine every morning. Once we had electricity, of course, we had black and white television. And one of our neighbors in East Pasture was, was Max Eastman. Well, they didn't extend the electricity there for a long time. So every Friday night, Max Eastman, when he was in Gay Head, Max Eastman would come over to our home and watch the fights, the Friday night fights. So it was like having another uncle around. He was, he was just a very, I, I loved him. He was a, a giant of a man. Everyone loved him. My great-grandfather, Francis Manning, I remember him vividly. He was just a dear, sweet man, very kind and gentle. He lived across the street from my grandparents off of Lighthouse Road. He had a big barn, which was in front of our house, and the barn was used by the family. They would mend fishing nets in the field, so oh we learned gosh. how to mend fishing nets at a young age. We stored cranberries there. We hung deer there during hunting season, and we had a lot of clay there that our other great-grandmother used for her craft work. She was Anna Madison Smalley. She would fill bottles, a lot of fancy bottles, with different colors of clay from the cliffs, with different layers of different colors. They were very pretty. She braided rugs, she made pot holders, she made yarn dolls, her beadwork. and her house around the dining room table, there was a bench and it went around two sides of the room in the window. I loved going over there when I was little. It was all a family affair and we would all sit there and work on things together. We helped her with everything, sorting the clay, cutting the wool for the rugs, helping her braid with the beadwork. She was the sister of Napoleon Madison, who was our medicine man at the time. He lived right across the street from her. And she and Napoleon would work all winter. You want a lot that? of nice items to sell up at the cliffs, at the Aquinas shop. And they would be up there every summer. We talked all the time about history, about Cranberry Day, about the old trails, 
about the Decay Head Cliffs. Anyone could take clay from the cliffs until 1966 when the cliffs became a national landmark. Even today, tribal members are still allowed to take clay. And we talked about the fishing, who was who. I just lived it. I lived it on a daily basis. It was wonderful. Oh, lovely. Wow, you did a great job, Lindsay. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry I'm late. I just snoozed. I uh, had a little surgical procedure this morning and... Uh, you deserve it. I mean, not the, not the procedure, but the snooze. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, uh, I, but you did a beautiful job of presenting it all. And uh, what, a, what a gorgeous presentation. Oh, thank so. you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you were the one who did the glorious job of telling the story. Um, <laughs> it has been, you know, it's so much fun to hear the stories from June, because she has this prodigious knowledge <laughs> of all sorts of walks of life on Martha's Vineyard with the tribe. She can even talk to you about Hollywood, uh, where she spent some time. And, uh, and she's so good about sharing it. Um, so it's just so much fun to listen to her talk. So um, what I'd love to do, June, is just ask you, do you have energy to answer some questions and ask? Sure, them? sure, yes. Okay. Um, one of the things, June, and you missed my tribute to you in the beginning. Oh, thank you. I will say it to you later. Thank um, you. Uh, is, you know, it, it seems so much in your growing up on, on the vineyard that traditions and holding on to traditions were important, the way you talk about it in the, in the piece. Do you want right. to talk a bit about some of the traditions that were important to you and your family? Um, you know, I, I feel as though it, our um, holidays were important. Cranberry Day was important. Um, getting together at the town hall was very important. Uh, we just, you know, kept everything alive. We, we went out on the fishing boats together, and uh, we did a lot of things as, as a family. We, we went cranberrying, uh, we picked beach plums every fall. It was just all part of our, our family life. And uh, you know, those are things that I passed on to my, my son and my grandchildren. Uh, even this morning on our way home, you know, I, you know, gave Paul a little bit of history on the way home. Um, but it's all just very important. And they, they appreciate it, and they acknowledge it, and they recognize it all. And uh, I'm very proud of them. They're, uh, and, you know, they're all good kids. <laughs> well, two of them are in their 30s, and Noah's 14. But they're all, they listen. They listen to me. So. And that's what's so most important. That's what we all need to learn right. to do is to listen, to listen right. to your wonderful stories, to the wonderful stories of other people. Tell me a little bit more about the routine of Cranberry Day and what you bring um, down to eat. Yeah, we would, all, we would just all get together and um, get together mostly in an oxen cart when we had them still around here. And it was it was a huge picnic it was uh you know mom would fry chicken with the other mothers and uh oh wait a minute i've lost you for a second and uh we can still see you okay and and uh our grandmother would bake apple pies and mincemeat pies with venison mm -hmm. um and we would all go down to the cranberry bogs and, and harvest. I have a couple of pictures that I love that show uh, Uncle Amos Smalley and Aunt Addie at the, at the cranberry bogs. And I would like to enlarge those and share them with others. Um, and we would harvest all morning, like we still do. And the 
kids would have lunch and then we'd slide down this great big hill of, of sand dune and uh and then we, we would play games most of the afternoon nowadays they have a feast at night but in the old days we just feasted at the beach and it was beautiful it's really nice so uh, those are those are things that my grandchildren enjoy now yeah. that I enjoyed um, as a child so the like I'm trying to send, um it seems like you did so much with your family much much oh more gosh, than yeah. people do now yes we were always together we were we were generations together we're, whether we went down island Christmas shopping or down island to dinner or or out on the Bozo to New Bedford or uh, you know, fishing over to no man's land, uh, you know, two or three generations together. We did a lot together. We were very close. Uh, very close. Talk about uh, the kind of route between uh, New Bedford and Gay Head and how you did a lot of things in New Bedford. Well, well uh, when we were very young, we would go over to New Bedford. It was easier to go to New Bedford than it was to go down island to go shopping. So we would, and, and not just our family, we would take other families with us. We'd take Christina Kestenbaum's family or, or Maisel, and uh, they would go with us shopping. And mostly we went to the Star Store or, the, or Cherry and Webb, but we also, um, bought a lot of things in bulk, whether it was flour or sugar or whatever staples there were that we needed, we would buy in bulk and then br bring it home and share it. But we also brought home coal from New Bedford or ice. You know, I, we filled the boat with ice and uh, it, was, it was just wonderful. And our grandfather, um, well, he didn't have any grand sons so he had three granddaughters but anyway he taught us how to steer by compass so that he could work on things on the boat whether he was fooling around with the, the uh, whatever equipment it was so we would steer the boat home from New Bedford and it was it was very uh, <coughs> excuse me it was very um, easy to steer the boat home from the bedroom, but once we got to uh, Quix's hole, we usually let him take over again. And, and, and I could never, even though I could steer the boat, I could never dock it alone. I could never do that, so. Joan, uh, uh, Joan tell the story about how you learned to row. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, my sister Judith and I, we were always, we were always in love. Uh, we were only 12 and a half months apart, but we were like twins. Everyone thought we were twins. So our grandfather went down to where um, Donald Hurley's house is at, at Nashaquitza. And we rode out to the boat with him and he had a little speed boat out there so we went out to pump it and to fix some of the me mechanics make sure everything was in working order and Judith and I uh mysteriously let the let the line go from the boat to the rowboat so we floated we floated back to shore uh right there at that curve and uh, we didn't know what we were going to do. Neither one of us knew how to row. So we had no idea what we were doing. And Luther Madison happened to see us when he was driving by. So he came down and helped us. He, he came down, got in the boat, rowed back to the, the boat's name was the Utellum. Rode back to the Utellum. And our grandfather took us down to, uh, down to the beach at Moshup Trail. I can't remember the name of the pond now. <laughs> it's, it's, but anyway, he took us down there that afternoon and taught us how to row. So we have learned, we learned how to row 
when we were teenagers, we had to, and we never did that again. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, the lighthouse, talk about the lighthouses. They were a big part of your life, weren't they? Um, the, the lighthouse was, but mostly it was, it was off limits. It was owned by the government at the time. And, uh, you know, so we really didn't go up there much, but the lighthouse keeper's house was a big part of our life because the Henley family were friends. And uh, Joe Henley and his wife came here, I would say probably around 1948 or 49. And they had a daughter, Betty, beautiful daughter, Betty, a blonde girl. She still lives over in Falmouth. And their son, Bobby, went to school with us at the Gay Head School. Excuse me. Uh, Bobby and I caught up with each other. Um, we hadn't seen each other from the 50s, but we caught up with each other in the 80s when he was a fireman and he came over for the fireman's muster. He has since passed away. But uh, we were always up at the, up at the uh, lighthouse keeper's house and you know, baking or, or, you know, just socializing and that was it. Um, the Coast Guard station was a, probably a lot more meaningful for us. We were over there as toddlers. We were, um, we were two and three years old and our mother baked a cake for the station crew almost every Sunday. And we would take it up to the, the station and our dad would play cards with them. And it was wonderful because in later years, I became very uh, friendly with some of the men who had served there when I was just a little girl. I was, um, you know, Bob Kinnicum, who ended up being a cousin-in-law, um, and Jesse Minor worked on the Steamship Authority. John Edwards became the harbor master in Edgartown. And, uh, you know, there was just a lot, of, a lot of the crew members that I remembered from then. And, and it was nice to regain that friendship. So, um, yeah. Uh, can you describe to everybody, because I don't think everybody knows where the Coast Guard station was? It's, it's about where uh, that the tailors have the outermost in at this time. So it was five minutes from our home at all the time. And um, the reason the Coast Guard station was built is because in January of 1884, the city of Columbus uh, was a, a wreck off of, dog, off of uh, oh gosh, Devil's Den. And from 1884 till 1995, you know, it took the government all that time to realize they needed a Coast Guard station there. We had had a boathouse at Squibnocket and there was one at Dogfish Bar. But in order to uh, have a crew, the, the crew here would take shifts and, and walk up and down the beach with lanterns and punch a clock and they, uh, would look for shipwrecks along the way over, overnight. So in 1895, the Coast Guard station was built and our great grandfather, Francis Manning, was part of the first crew in, when it opened in 1896. And not only was Francis part of the first crew, but um, Jane, uh, Slater's great uncle was part of the first crew and Lindley Mayhew um, was part of the first crew as well. So it was mostly half uh, gay head men and half Tilmark men and they, they manned the station until, you know, they were under the auspices of the Massachusetts Humane Society and uh, they were part of the United States Life Saving Service until it became the Coast Guard in 1915. So um, it, it was always, and, and then, you know, we were there until 
1952 when they decided they were going to have to abandon the station because of the erosion. And they uh, barged the Cuddy Hunk station over to Menemptia, uh August 3rd, 1954. And they rolled it up the hill on, 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 um, on planks or, or um, like phone poles. They rolled it up the hill to the position it sits there now. Um, so it, it was, uh, and we went down there and played as well. <laughs> Our family was very friendly with this, the chief, um, who was you, from Pro Providence, Provincetown. Did you see the um, cutty hunk? Uh, Being brought over? Yeah. Yes, our grandfather was part of the uh, the team that was floating it over. They were bringing it over. Cool. And, and allegedly, allegedly, uh, they filled the house, they filled the Coast Guard station with dynamite because if it tipped over and tipped off the barge, there was nothing else they could do. They couldn't leave it in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. So. They allegedly filled it with dynamite uh, in case anything happened, and then they could just blow it up. But it survived. Interesting. Yeah, huh. and, and it's still there today. So in Manemsa. And do you have an ongoing strong um, relationship with each Coast Guard crew that's there? Talk about I that a little bit. I do. I, you know, I. Um, because the Coast Guard station was up here from 1896 until 1952, and because our great grandfather served in the life saving service, we were always there for them. Bob Kinnicum said that our grandmother did everything she could for them up at the station. They were five minutes away. You know, we would make dinners for them. We would, as I said, our mom would bake cakes for them. They were friends. They were they were part of our extended family, and you, I don't know if any of you know the story of Bernie Weber, but Bernie Weber um, left here. He Bernie Weber was stationed here in like 1946, and he was sent here to assist lighthouse keeper Greeter because Mr. Greeter had had a stroke and and needed assistance. So Bernie Weber uh, would live at the Coast Guard station and he was sort of like, he was in the Coast Guard, but he would also be the uh, assistant lighthouse keeper. And so he would, in the middle of the night in blizzards, he would walk from the station over to the lighthouse to help light the lanterns. Uh, Bernie Weber left here in probably 1948 and went over to Chatham Station on the Cape. He was one of the most heroic Coast Guardsmen around. He, there were two huge freighters that broke up in, in um, I believe it was February, 1952. And he went out and rescued 34 men from one of the huge freighters. There's a movie about him. It's called uh, "The Longest The Lo Longest Hours," I think. Uh, but it's a very it's a unbelievable movie, and he was acknowledged and rewarded for his heroism for that for rescuing 34 people. So, uh, and he he resided right here in, in Gay Head at the time. Prior to prior to going to Chatham, um, but my relationship with the the station has continued. I am very friendly with most of the uh, all of the families um, because our family would would uh, help them in any way we could. I continue that tradition today, and my children and my grandchildren know they have to carry that on when I'm gone. Uh, I try to have dinner with them at least once a month. As a matter of fact, it's on our way home this afternoon, Paul took me for a ride through the rough around circle in front of the station. I would have, I would have stopped 
and I would have opened the window and said, all hands on deck, and they would have all come out and waved to me, but uh, that didn't happen. Uh, so I still maintain that friendship. And during the, um, the, the shutdown of the government two years ago, I went out and I collected uh, a lot of money for them. We have started the Coast Guard Menemsha Spouses Association, and uh, we it, it's we have um, we, it's for me basically morale for the crew and their families who are here, and we also. Uh, decided to have offered two scholarships at the end of the school year so that children whose families have served at station in Amsha will have a, a, a little scholarship to go to college and do what they'd like to do. Um, so I maintain that and I'm actually the community liaison. I was named the community liaison to the Spouses Association. So I, 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 that, I love that position. So, and I get together, usually the spouses get together once a month and we have a business meeting and plan what we're going to do. We have fundraisers, we've ordered t-shirts and sweatshirts, which are available. And uh, we have, pre we had previously had open house in May of 2019, which once this pandemic is over, we're going to have another one. We hope to have like a dinner at the PA club. Uh, and and it's, it would be another fundraiser. And then we also sold t-shirts and sweatshirts at, um, in Menemsha for, um, the Fisherman's Preservation Trust Day, which is like August 1st, I believe. And then we have another little celebration on August 4th, which is Coast Guard Day. The Coast Guard was formed on August 4th, 1790. And so we honor that day as well. So we were a very didn't, active group. Didn't I say that June is a pivotal person <laughs> in making this island work and bringing together people? And she's, she's lazy, she doesn't do much, but, uh, but when she does, she does it good. Uh, so um, the, 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 I'm gonna ask two questions that are sort, that are, you've sort of just answered one thing. Uh -huh. but, um, one is, um, this is kind of the obnoxious question I hate, but one is, um, what does it mean to you to be a Wampanoag and also, can you talk a bit about the, in 1974, getting together the cultural um, sure. enrichment programs? Sure. Um, you know, I, I always pronounce our tribe Wampanoag. And I tell people when they look at me, I'm, I'm like, that is what I learned when I was two years old. And that is how I pronounce it. Uh, it was just... It was just that we knew we were li we were little Indian children from a, a Indian community, and uh, you know we all went to most of us went to the same church. We went to the same school. We our parents were all contemporaries. They were, we always socialized together. And in 1960, so it was part of us. It, it, we knew it was part of us. You know, we had relatives down island that was were members of the Portuguese community. Uh, we had, you know, relatives that were part of a German community. We had, you know, so there were there were little ethnic groups, and but we knew that we were Indian, and and that's the way we were raised. But in 1974, Joan Gentry Pata, who just passed away a few weeks ago, uh, we wrote grants and we started the, um, it, was, it was a Title IV program through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So we had a uh, cultural enrichment program for the school children between five 
age five and, and through high school. And I can remember I said to my family a couple of weeks ago, I said, one little boy looked up at me with his beautiful eyes and he said, is it okay to be Indian? And, you know, we reassured him that, yes, it was okay to be Indian. He was actually from a, a Portuguese community as well. So we, Joan and I met with the children, I would say four days a week. We met up island at the town hall two days a week, and we met at the Baptist Church Parish House in Vineyard Haven two days a week. We brought in a lot of our tribal elders to teach them uh, tradition and to teach them uh, cooking and, and fishing and, and whatever we could do. I remember our grandmother Ada taught them how to bake pies. Uh, Gladys Wittes came in and taught them how to do pottery, as did Winona Silva. Um, our grandfather took them out on his fishing boat, the Ada and Helen. He took them over to Cuddy Hunk for a day, which was wonderful. We took the children up to Boston to a circus, um, to the Franklin Park Zoo. We we just did as much as we could with them to in, indulge them in, in, in their culture and heritage and, and to let them know the way the rest of the world lives as well. And um, we, we um, made our regalia and, and presented it in the um, In, in the, um, we, we had a, a procession down the cliffs. We would call it the pageant, which was written locally. And we would perform the pageant in mime. We would, you know, there would be a narrator. When, when in the 1940s, our mother would probably narrate one year, and then the next year, she'd probably be Squant, who was Masha's wife. But we all met up at the Aquinas shop. There were about a thousand motor vehicles in town, parked all around the circle and down State Road. And we would leave from uh, the edge of the, the Aquinas shop and head out towards Man uh, uh, No Man's Land. And we had a huge rock in the middle, which was called Devil's Den. And we would perform the legends of Masha around this rock. And the young men uh, carried kerosene uh, hand lanterns, not lanterns, but, but um, they, were, they were carried by, by the hand and, and they lit the way, they, they led the way down the, to Devil's Den. Torches. Torches, yes, thank you. And so we would perform the legend of Mashup about Mashup and his wife Squant and their 12 sons and their 12 daughters and their lifestyle in, in Gay Head at the time. And how at the end of, his, towards the end of his life, Mashup gave his children the choice of becoming uh, either killer whales, which was right around Gay Head, or um, he gave his pet frog, uh, he, he um, made his pet frog into a rock. And that is what we call uh, toad rock. And toad rock is a large boulder off of Masha Trail. And in the old days, people would take, take messages there and leave them in the rock. It was like our mailbox. And people, you know, they lived, they lived uh, separately between the east side and the west side, but they had their little, their little quirks and, but they would always leave messages there for another person on the other side of town. So, yeah. Would you sneak and read somebody else's message? Probably not. No, no. <laughs> You'd have to see who it was for. Hopefully, right, right. hopefully they put the name on the top of it. So. 
And, and so Joan and I had the, um, the cultural enrichment program for, I, I only did it for about two years, but we taught the kids pottery and beadwork and leather work. Uh, and I said, as I said, we took them, we took them to the Vineyard Museum at, at the time. Uh, so we did as much as we could to, to expose them to as much as possible. And, and a lot of those children, you know, remember me from that. You know, it's amazing, but they do. And uh, June, did you, had you felt that there was kind of a dearth of that, that there wasn't enough um, knowledge passed on about the culture it, it, at that point? Um, at, at that point, yes, because there were, at, at, in 1972 is the time we were beginning to uh, uh, try to achieve federal acknowledgement from the from the United States government. So this was also part of the plan, uh, and and we became federally acknowledged in 1987. But um, that was the beginning of us on our off days. Joan and I would go to the Vineyard Gazette office, and we would look up. Uh, we'd do a lot of research there on on newspaper articles and tried and piece the uh, genealogy together and find any other uh, historical facts that we could. But um, it, was, it was the beginning of our federal acknowledgement process. So um, it, it was very significant, believe me. And did that get you hooked on the genealogy work you did That know? was the beginning, yes. And uh, my kids look at the massive amounts. <laughs> I think my daughter-in-law, Teresa, said, you, <laughs> the amount of photocopying you have. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so um, I do hope to get it all together before I go anywhere. Uh, yes, but that was the beginning. That was the very beginning. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm going to... Um... There's so many questions to ask you, but I'm going to open it up to, so if people don't ask questions, I'll ask you some more. But um, okay. does anyone else have questions they want to ask you that they've been a secret of Aquina that they always wanted to know? Yeah, Jill. Hi, I'm Jill. Um, it's not really a question about Aquina, but I was wondering if your sister stayed on island. Um, my sister, Judith, has lived in Toronto. She, she, we both left here in the 60s and moved to Boston for a few years. And she, um, when she got married in 1978, I was just telling the kids this the other night, she moved to Venezuela the next day. She and her husband got married at the United Nations Chapel and they moved to Venezuela the next day. He was, um, he was, working, he, he was in advertising with Gray Advertising, so he had a transfer. And they lived there for three and a half years. As a matter of fact, we were there uh, 40 years ago this week to visit them for 10 days. Um, but she stayed there for three and a half years and, and they got out before the government collapsed in Venezuela. Mm. And since then, since 1981, she has resided in Toronto. Um, we have a younger sister, Jill, who spent a number of years in White Plains, New York. She owned her own taxi company. Uh, and she worked for Neiman Marcus and um, that other big store, Neiman Marcus. And I forgot the other one, but she worked for them for a few years. And she's been back on the vineyard for about 30 years five years, maybe wow. 30 years. Um, Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and you know, I, I have to tell you, we were all born and raised on the vineyard. Our parents separated in 1956. Mm -hmm. And our mother took us from Gay Head to Hollywood, California. <laughs> so we spent about 15 months in Hollywood, California. I went to three different schools. Uh, on the way back in August of 1957, we stopped at our grandmother's home in 
Pleasantville, New York, where the Reader's Digest used to be. And we lived there for four years. And then in 1961, our mother insisted that we go to the School of Creative Arts, which was out at West Chop, across from Dr. Santos' office. And we had ballet, we had swimming twice a day, we had modern, modern dance, um, arts and crafts. And going to that school then, and knowing what I know now, I would have never sent my children there. Uh, it was run by, by Kathleen Henney, who was a, a dancer in New York who had studied under Martha Duncan. And she really ran it on a shoestring. Uh, I, was reading, I was reading something from one of the girls on, on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, and she said, I'll never forget the night we had lettuce for dinner. <laughs> take us out once a week. She would bring us up to Gayhead, out to Chappaquiddick. Uh, we went to see a streetcar named Desire at the theater, which was above the Edgartown Town Hall at the time. I don't think she took us anywhere where we would have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a great reunion with some of the counselors in 1999. And, and there were, I mean, Judith and Jill and I, I went one year, Judith went two, and Jill went three years. But Cynthia Vanderhoop was also an attendee, as was Linda Jeffers Coombs. I think Linda was a day student. Um, I'm trying to think of who else there was that went from the tribe. But it, was a, it wasn't a great experience. But, you know, it, Judith did well at ballet. Um, I just wasn't interested in any of it. Jill did well at ballet as well. So, but, so at the end of that August 1961, um, <clears throat> you know, being cooped up on, on East Chop, uh, no, West Chop for the summer, uh, when our mother came to pick us up, she said, well, you can stay, you know, with your grandparents and your dad for a couple of weeks. And after two days, we called her in New York and we said, Mom, we're staying here. We're not, we're not coming back to New York. You know, that was it. We'd had it with New York, Hollywood, soccer. <laughs> you know, we wanted to get back to our youth. We wanted to get back to what we knew as, as young children. So it was a um, great story. That's how, so we've been back since 1981. And, and, uh, you know, after living in, in Boston for almost eight years, New York for Hollywood for a year, there's no place like home. I've been to 35 states. I've been to probably six uh, Caribbean islands, uh, as far south as Caracas, as far north as Toronto, and there's no place like home. You could not mm -hmm. move me. Not at all. This is it. <laughs> and, and I'm actually on the property where my parents brought me home to, which was our grandparents' home yeah. uh, when I came home from the hospital in 1947. So it, there's a significant um, meaning to me. It's very meaningful. This is it. So. Thanks, June. Yeah. yeah. What, one more question. We've been talking for so sure. long, but um, I want you to describe a career that you did for a couple of years that you did not like when you came home from Boston and came to the vineyard. This is the scalloping. Oh gosh, that was before. That, that was, oh yeah, that was a, I went scalloping every morning with my grandparents and my dad. Um, our father was in business. He had, he was in business with this guy Charlie's Folly over on Nantucket because Nantucket didn't have scallops that year. So I would get up at probably five o'clock, six in the morning, have breakfast with my grandparents. Dad would pick us up, we'd go down to the pond. We, our boat was uh, docked in Menemsha. We'd get on the boat, go out and scallop until about noontime or whenever we had our, our limit. My grandparents would come home and have their lunch, and Dad and I would pick up 50-pound bags of burlap bags of scallops. 
from Gay Head down to Oak Bluffs. And we shucked scallops at uh, Earl and Mary Peter's garage until 10 or 11 at night. And it wasn't just us, it was, you know, it was dad and I and my grandparents, Leonard Vanderhoop, uh, I think Billy Vanderhoop was there for a while. And, and we shucked until 10 or 11 at night, and then we'd come home and go to bed and start all over again in the next morning. I have not been scalloping since. <laughs> Never. It doesn't interest me at all. So, uh, but that was one job I did. But mostly I've worked in healthcare. I, uh, when I, I started out up at Tufts Medical Center in my, excuse me, 1966, and when I came home in December of 72, I got a job at the hospital um, in February of 73, and I started working there as the admitting clerk and the front, front desk receptionist. And then I got scooped up by Dr. Rappaport, and I went to work for him for eight years on and off, um, part-time, full-time sometimes. Uh, I, I, um, I have helped, th I think, three of the physicians open their offices on the vineyard, and I've helped four of them close their offices. Uh, I ended up back at Martha's Vineyard Hospital, and I worked for Dr. Gail Elliott in radiology, which I enjoyed immensely. I, uh, I worked for Dr. Peter Larson that, that that was next to the last. Peter Larson, I worked for for four years. I worked for Dr. Charlie Clayton until he um, retired in 1998. But I also got asked to fill in at other desks. When Dr. Stuart Kendall's secretary went home to Scotland for six weeks, I filled in for her. I filled in at Dr. Goldfein's office for a couple of weeks. Um, and on weekends, I worked for Dr. Bigby and Dr. Michael Drew, who was an orthopedist. Uh, and then, because I had such fabulous training from all of these physicians, I have done a lot of elder care. And um, it's, it, it's been very gratifying to do elder care, uh, but I think those days are done. And, and I will tell you that two of my clients, in 2006 were Art Buckwald. My sister Jill and I cared for Art Buckwald his last summer here. And then I went on to take care of Bill Styron. And the Styrons took me to the national premiere of Sophie's, no, the American premiere of Sophie's Choice at the National Opera. And uh, that was amazing. Um, that truly amazing, something I'll always, always remember. It was just gorgeous. Uh, and not many, not many young girls, I used to tell Mr. Styron, I'm, I'm like, Mr. Styron, I'm just like, you know, I go home and I clean my own floors. <laughs> what, what was that girl's name that in the, in the, uh, as a young girl, it was one of, one of the, you know, but anyway, I, <laughs> whatever that girl was who did her own work at home. That's, that was me. I said, you know, <laughs> that's what I have to do. <laughs> I can, might come down here and take care of you and everything looks like, you know, rosy, but I go home and I do my own homework too, my own housework. So. Cinderella. Yeah. Cinderella, <laughs> that was it. Cinderella. Yes. Yes. Cinderella. Yeah. Mm. So, um, and, and I've had other wonderful opportunities along the way. I really have. I've been very, uh, the, the first physician I ever worked for was Dr. Richard Norton, who was professor of gastroenterology up at Tufts Medical. And he had offered me to go to medical school. He was going to, and I was 25 and I thought, I'm too old. I, I can't do this. So I passed up that opportunity. Um, but I always wish I had gone to medical school. Been should have, June. I know. I should have. <laughs> I should have. I really I, love it. I, love I it. think 
You brought so much good medicine to people on the vineyard. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and just in so many different ways. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I have to tell you, I've had some, all, I've had some other odd jobs. My brother-in-law, Kenny Rose, owned Gay Head Sightseeing Company. So I would sell uh, tour bus tickets, Highline boat tickets, and rent taxis, rent bicycles. I did that. Um, but my, I guess my, Teresa told me it's my uh, fame to fortune now. I have been the Chilmark Beach sticker clerk for the past six summers. So. <laughs> and I love that job. I love it. Uh, you never know who you're going to meet in the office, although the office was closed this past summer. But uh, yeah, it was a meaningful position. So, it's, uh, but, uh, you know, I've been fortunate. I've been very fortunate along the way. And, and as far as my genealogy, the only time I ever charge for my genealogy is when I'm doing um, research for an attorney. But the other thing um, that probably not everyone knows, I, I am a birth parent. Um, I'm a birth mother. I had two children when I was teenagers. I was a teenager. I had to give them up for adoption and I've been reunited with them. And it's a blessing. Uh, but the other thing is I've gone out and assisted more than 50 other families in reuniting with their, their long lost loved ones as well. So that's another thing I work on almost every day is reuniting families. And I do that free of charge as well. So the only, the only time I get paid for my, my genealogy is when I'm doing it for attorneys. And then I, I have no clue who I'm doing it for. I just do the research and that's it. I have no idea who, who's who or what's what. So um, I've had a very interesting life. Um, I hope I'll be around a little while longer. I have a lot more. We I hope talk, so too. <laughs> I tell my doctors I've still got a lot of living to do. You know, they look at me like, uh, do we, do we need to do, do you have a DNR order? And I'm like, nope, I don't have a DNR order. I still have a lot of living to do. So you got to keep me going. <laughs> um, the, the story about, um, about your son and reuniting with him and yeah. how long ago to tell that just because it's such a I mean yeah. he came coming back to you was the right thing for him to do right a, right yeah. and and you know God bless him I, I I am so blessed that Paul is in my life at this time um I'm trying to think of how that started that, that's one thing I can't remember. But we've been reunited since uh, June of 1992. And uh, miraculously, he, he, we were reunited on June 16th, 1992. And my youngest grandchild, Noah, was born on July, uh, June 16th, 2006. So mm -hmm. there is a connection there. But um, I know what it was. My sisters and I had some... Uh, cousins who were suing us for like half a million dollars, claiming they were um, trying to obtain some of the money and property from their grandfather's property. I had 30 days to prove them wrong. I had 30 days to prove that they were not this man's children. I went to the Vineyard Gazette, I went to the Martha's Vineyard Museum, I went to the church records, I asked everyone in town, I spoke with the elders, and um, the last thing I did was our late town clerk, Jean Ann Jeffers, provided me with the logbook from the town clerk's office. And I brought it home one lunch hour when she dropped me off, and the first page I opened to was, it said, baby boy Manning. And I'm like, oh my God. So his, they had crossed everything out, all my information. And they put in his father, his adoptive father, who was born in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And his adoptive mother, who was born in um, Old Town, Maine. Well, Old Town, Maine is where the 
Penobscot Indians live. So I called my friend up at Old Town, uh, Jim Sapier, the late Jim Sapier, who was the governor of the Penobscot tribe. And I said, Jim, do you know this Ranko family? He says, oh yes, very good family, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I also had a friend working on it, on her computer, and found a lot of the information as well. And then I had a friend who worked for the Registry of Motor Vehicles. And he said, well, your son tends to speed around like you do. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So that night, uh, my friend Wendy came over and we sat down and we called Paul in Florida. He wasn't at home at the time. He was out showing friends a map of where he was born in Gayhead. He was born at our, our home up by the lighthouse. Um, and uh, he called back a few hours later. And uh, we spoke on the phone for five hours that night. That was on a Friday night. And he arrived here on Tuesday and he's still here. <laughs> so, and I'm so blessed that he is here. He's been unbelievably supportive of me through my recent illness. So um, I, I'm very blessed. But, and then a couple of years later, I found my daughter. She was born in New York. Uh, she, lives in, she lives in Mesa, Arizona. And I'm not really that close with her. You know, we were just not that close, sadly. Um, I think it's her, but that's okay. And I have one granddaughter in Mesa, Arizona, and one in Las Vegas. And I have three great grandchildren in Las Vegas. My oldest great grandson will be 18 this week. And uh, of course, here I have three grandchildren Chris, Kayla, and Noah, and my six year old great granddaughter, Kylie. So, yeah, my family blossomed <laughs> significantly. And I love it. So it's good to see all of you. You know, I've been kind of, the kids were over here on, on Monday and it's like, you know, we all thought a year ago this time, we all thought the pandemic was gonna be over in two weeks and here we are still hiding. Mm. So, yeah. Hang in there, June. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. You. you yeah. Thank you. This has been yeah. so nice to hear sure. your stories, and there are so many more. There um, are many more. There are yeah. many more. Yeah. Maybe I can listen I'll... to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Maybe someday I'll write a book. Okay. But, um, Please had do. a very, very charmed life, believe me. That's for sure. And, and if any of you were on, on Facebook, I'm a Facebook junkie, <laughs> I put a photograph of um, our Gay Head School um the kids from the gay head school that was about 1954 and you'll recognize all of them you know uh -huh. jeffrey christina christina silas william ronald i've, se I've seen some of those pictures yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so my my grandchildren are uh, organizing my um uh, you know my my uh whatever they can they're they're my photographs, my research papers, they're, they're really organizing everything for me. And I hope to get it all into books and albums and some kind of order before I go anywhere. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> you can Quite read a treasure trove. <laughs> in <laughs> this, um, oh gosh, this Lindsay Lee, Lindsay Lee, it, she caught up with me three years in a row. And so I'm in Vineyard Voices 3, and she captured a lot of, of my life in there. So You should see how much is still just in the transcripts. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. That's what I said. I said yeah. Gosh, there had to have been 60 pages a year. But um, yeah, so she captured that and was published a year and a half ago? Or has it been two yeah. years now? No, I think, it, it, yeah, a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, yeah. 2019. So if, you all, if you all get a chance, please, please uh, go to the museum and purchase a copy. It's, uh, I've enjoyed all three of her Vineyard Voices. 
you know, those are, those are my contemporaries. Those are people that not only I grew up with, but, you know, our family grew up with. And, and you know, our dad went to, to uh, Tisbury School for a while. He went down island with Ruth Stiller and, and um, mm -hmm. oh gosh, I was just reading his the other day. Uh, he owns a little shack at the foot of the museum. What was his name? Stuart Banks. Yeah, Stuart Banks. He went to school with Stuart Banks, and and so he, you know, we didn't. Uh, school ended up in up in Gay Head. Uh, I think he went in sixth grade was the end up here. So everyone had to go to Tisbury School. Or um, in later years, they've got they've been able to go to West Tisbury School. But but even when our dad was a youngster, he had to go to Tisbury School. And and his his he lived with his aunt and uncle in um, in Vineyard Haven for a few years. He'd come home on weekends, but he lived down there so he could go to school every day. So yeah, but we've had quite a quite a uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so in in my semi retirement, I have tried to. Uh, do as much as I can around the vineyard. I try to serve where I can and uh, be as useful as I can. So, um. Well, the island wouldn't function without you, Jim. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. That's true. So, you know, and I uh, have to say, you're not semi anything. You are full <laughs> of everything. <laughs> oh, you don't sound retired to me, Jim. Right. No, no, no. So, I know. But I'm just slowing down a little, so yeah. You've earned it. I have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you all, thank you all, all for listening, for tuning oh. in and listening and listening to my tales and you know. We could keep you, you we, going for four or five more hours, but that oh, would be I know, cruel. I know. <laughs> um, so, but when but. you look at me, it's not like you know. Oh, okay, there she is. The, Chilmark Beach sticker clerk, you know, there's a little bit more of me than yeah. just, just <laughs> right, a clerk, right. so. just clerk work. <laughs> so, so June, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank God you all bless. for being here today. Thank you, June. Yep. God bless. Thank you. Thanks, June. Yep. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye. <laughs>